Well, David Coletto has been taking a closer look at the campaign by the numbers for us. He's the CEO of Abacus Data and joins us today from Vancouver. David, good to see you again. Thanks for being with us. My pleasure. For, first, let's see where we are in the, in the campaign horse race. Let's start there and then we can move on from that. What, what's the headline as we look at numbers now? Well, it's, it's still deadlocked. What I've done here is I've taken all the polls that have come out over the last few days and averaged them out. And what we get is literally a tie, 34% for the Liberals, 34%. Uh, for the Conservatives, the NDP's at 14 and the Greens are at 10. And what I've done here is looked at what has changed since the beginning of the campaign. And what we actually see is not much. The, the Liberals and the Conservatives are both down about a point from when this campaign started. The NDP's up three points, um, not insignificant, but not you know fundamentally different from where they were. And uh, the Greens are basically holding as well, only down one point in Quebec. Uh, the block is is about where they were. They've they've seen some in, increase, but but at five percent nationally is 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 uh, really where they were at the start of this campaign. Oh, okay, um, let let's take a look at the polling average from averages from just before the campaign started until now. Uh, and this is always I always like this because it gives you kind of a a line that you can follow to tell you who's had sort of ups and downs and where we're moving. What what does that say to you when you look at these lines? Well, it says. Clearly, I think that not a lot has changed, right? Those lines are pretty flat um, for the first three weeks of this campaign, despite how much has happened, um, whether it's the, the photos of the prime minister in blackface, whether it's the first debate, McLean's debate, or, or even the debate um, this week, um, the French language debate, we haven't seen a whole lot of change overall. Some polls have shown, you know, the numbers go up slightly, some go down slightly. But the average really has shown a lot of consistency, that, that there has been some movement in terms of who's slightly ahead or who's slightly behind. But so far, um, it's one of the remarkable things about this campaign has been how consistent these numbers have been, how little uh, campaign events have moved people away from you know, where they were uh, going to vote and where might they vote uh, two weeks or so from now. And I think that is something to watch really closely. In my view, there's, there's, either, there's two things either happening here. Uh, one is that people are really locked in, right? That they aren't, um, there's not, no reason for them right now to be moving from their, their intention or their vote intention. Another um, alternative is, though, that there's a lot of voters out there who are not changing their intended vote, but aren't fully locked in. And we won't know whether which one of those is true, obviously, until Election Day. But the consistency of these numbers uh, if we go back to you know the, the last few campaigns that we've had at the federal level, these numbers have moved far more over those campaigns than what we've seen so far. So this level of consistency and how people are feeling is something so far quite unique about this campaign. All right, do we, let, let, let's have, let's look at the numbers behind the numbers and and dig down a bit in the regions uh, to help us understand um, you know where that national number comes from and you know how the country kind of breaks down. It also helps us understand certainly in the next two weeks of the campaign. Uh, why you're going to see leaders go where they go. And we're seeing some of that already today. But let's look at those right. regional numbers. When you look at it, uh, any significant changes to see there in voter, in, in what people are saying to you and where, how the parties are polling? And what does it tell us? Well, not a whole lot across the board. If we go from the west to the east, we start out in B.C. where I am right now. Um, it's a very close race in B.C., a much more uh, three or four party race, in fact, than in other parts of the country. The Liberals and the Conservatives are are, are basically, you know, more or less tied. The Conservatives have a slight advantage in, in BC over the Liberals, but you see those elevated NDP and Green numbers in British Columbia. And, and even in BC, you know, the province as a whole isn't uniform. What's happening on Vancouver Island, where you're going to have likely three, maybe four-way races in some ridings, is very different than what you might be seeing in the interior in, or in some parts of the lower mainland. And so BC remains a, a really important battleground, which suggests that these numbers hold. Peter, you and I are going to be on together an election night, we're going to be up late before we might even know how this election ends. Right. If we move over the Rockies and we look at uh, Alberta, um, you know, solidly liberal, um, excuse me, solidly conservative, that's been that way uh, for the entire campaign. It's been that way for a really long time. And, and the conservatives look poised to do very well. Going into the prairies, you know, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, two very different provinces. We combine them um, probably at our peril sometimes because Saskatchewan has been trending heavily towards the conservatives and Manitoba in the polling that we do have available, because sample sizes are typically smaller, it's more competitive, particularly in Winnipeg. So I think there'll be a, a lot of eyes on, on that. And then we come to Ontario. 
where we have seen some shifts uh, over the course of the campaign. Uh, some polls have suggested it's closer than others, but the average suggests the Liberals have uh, a five-point lead in Ontario. Um, that's that's helped primarily by a big lead in the, the city of Toronto. Mm -hmm. Outside of the formal 416 area code, um, it's it's more competitive. But but even then, I think the Liberals are, are still holding that lead in, in, in Ontario, and that is giving them, I think, the confidence um, to, to probably win more seats if these numbers hold. Then there's Quebec. And Quebec has actually seen some movement, um, and it, it's been interesting. The Liberals have, have maintained their lead throughout the whole campaign. But one of the, I think, sub-stories of this campaign, and I think we won't quite know yet what impact the French language debate uh, on TVA had, is the Bloc is really playing as a wild card. How, how much support can the Bloc uh, develop between now and Election Day? Because their leader is relatively unknown in Quebec, but I think he performed well. Um, uh, at that debate, and and so that that remains one right. of those wild cards. How well does the bloc do? Can the cons are the conservatives going to get uh, harmed by by perhaps a, a less than stellar performance by Mr. Scheer? And how many seats can the Liberals pick up? And then finally, in Atlantic Canada, um, the Liberal lead there has been solid. We haven't seen much movement uh, in those numbers, and so um, you know they'll likely lose a few seats, but it still looks like uh, it's it's solidly a red uh, red region for the. For the Liberals. Okay, a couple things to finish up on here, and and, and one is, I mean, we you, you touched on uh, the blackface controversy and Justin Trudeau. Now we have this dual citizenship controversy for for Andrew Scheer. But I mean, if you looked at the blackface controversy, it, it didn't seem to you know move the numbers a whole lot. Maybe a blip for a day, and then it was gone again. Uh, it's, I'm not sure. It may take a while to see what happens with the dual citizenship. Uh, issue in Andrew Scheer, but uh, do you think this is an issue that, that moves voters, or is this another one of those possible blip things? I, I'm not sh I'm not sure it's going to move many voters away. I think if, if, if you think of who, um, uh, what's driving these voters right now by, by party, um, you know, it might prevent Andrew Scheer from growing, you know, his support, the share of the vote, um, but that's never really, I think, been what the Conservatives have wanted in this campaign. What, what matters more to them is that their voters are motivated so that when it comes time to vote, conservatives are uh, going to be more likely to actually turn out. I don't think this changes that. Their motivation is still primarily to be, defeat okay. Justin Trudeau and elect Andrew Scheer. I don't think you know him having dual citizenship and not telling anyone about it uh, really changes that. But it does perhaps give, um, you know, it, it's all about momentum. Campaigns are all about stories and how, how quickly these stories change. And it, it's taken attention away from, you know, litigating whether the Liberals deserve to be reelected, and now put more focus on Andrew Scheer. So, if anything, it, it, it might change the dynamics, but I, I still don't feel that this is going to fundamentally change. Oh, okay, that. let's finish on this. How, how, how important is the debate Monday night? I think it could be really important. I think it's going to be the first chance that most Canadians um, we're going to see all five leaders on the stage at the same time. Um, I think it, it's it's going to be important for. For voters in Ontario and BC in particular, but across the country, and I think it's a chance um, for them to gauge these leaders. What we don't know is, you know, having Max Bernier on that stage, having Elizabeth May. It, there's a lot of a lot of people, and it's hard sometimes for any one of them to stand out. I do think it's going to be particularly important for Andrew Scheer, given um, what what by all accounts was a poor performance uh, in the French language debate, for him to really make the case about why. Uh, Justin Trudeau doesn't deserve re-election and, and why he, uh, more voters need to take a look at him. All right, David Coletto, as always, uh, thanks for your perspective and uh, we'll see you on Monday night. Thanks, Peter.